next it's time to sit back and enjoy a piece of history on Granada Reports. The general election is just around the corner and one of the big campaigns ahead of May the 7th is to try to engage young people with politics. Yeah, so we decided to play our part. We gathered four of the region's leading politicians and students from four high schools and colleges in one room to discuss some of the issues that matter to them. And this is what happened. Here's Lucy, who hosted the debate at the People's History Museum in Manchester with some of the highlights. Yes, thank you. Take 80 teenagers, four of our leading politicians, and a variety of hard-hitting questions that makes up the Granada Report's election 2015 school debate. <laughs> Our first question, please. Thank you. Um, when money is so tight, I never thought it would be fair to charge people who are overweight or who smoke or drink too much treatment on their NHS. So charge people who, in effect, are contributing to their illnesses. What would you say to that, Mike Stoyce? It's, it's a very easy thought, isn't it? But I think somebody who's massively overweight or is dependent on, on drugs, their mind's a different place. And the notion that you then say, well, we're not going to treat you, or you have to pay for it yourself, I think is just abhorrent. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we should be charging people. I don't think you can determine why somebody's got a problem. I mean, Lucy, you just mentioned cancer as an example. Some people um, have contributory causes to, to, towards cancer, like smoking. Um, would you start charging them then for treatment for lung cancer? How many of you here are absolutely committed to maintaining the National Health Service? There you go. The, the answer speaks for itself. It is a part of our national DNA and that's how it should be maintained. Uh, my dad was in hospital for a long time last year. I find it astonishing that Saji can sit on that stage and claim that his party is interested in protecting the NHS when it's the Conservatives who are uh, systematically dismantling it and changing the, f the nature of the NHS. Aidan, um, you have to recognise that much of the reform programmes and much of the delivery programmes that you are referring to have been carried out by the current government and that is not just Conservative policy, that is the British government's policy at this moment in time. I don't think the Lib Dems are much better anyway, if that's uh, what you're trying to weasel out of that. Um, no, I wasn't. The, the, I wasn't. The second point is that... What, what makes you think that, well, that, that there is this plan to dismantle the health service? So how are the hospitals in, the, in, in England where Virgin Healthcare are running, are running a hospital well, instead well, you know, of the NHS? You know the can we just let... The biggest privatisation was when Labour were in power mm. with, with public financed hospitals. And it's yeah. costing us billions and billions of pounds to pay off. When Labour were in power, 5% was in private hands, it's now 6%. So give us some examples, rather than doing a sort of generalised sweep, give us some examples of, ha of, the, bad, of, the, bad, of the, bad, the bad care that your dad got in hospital and why you think it's... No, no, he didn't get any bad care and that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried that if it continues... You don't need to worry. He, he won't. <coughs> and to be fair, I'm not a politician. I can't reel off uh, facts and figures. But I don't, I'm not standing up for Labour either. So I don't where, think where do you get these views from, though? From what you've heard in the media or just your gut feeling or well, what you've yeah, read? I don't say patronising. I mean, it's not patronising it at all. Yeah. No, where not. do you get these views from? He gets them from experience but in hospital and being concerned about what's he's, happening. He's, he's a, an intelligent person who's making some quite clear views, and I want to understand those. Let's move on to our next question. Aaron Derbyshire. Could Britain survive without being a member of the European Union? I, I could answer that. Yes. <laughs> and the reason is this. What makes the go world go round is commerce, trade. We don't need to be in the EU, which is a political institution, in order to trade with Europe, which is a group of countries. Guess which country is the biggest customer for most of the EU mainland countries like Germany, France, Great Britain. Millions of jobs in Germany, France, Italy and Spain rely on being able to sell to our market. We do not need to be in the EU to trade with it. Do you think that we should stay in the EU? I think we should get out of the EU as quick as we possibly can. Why? Because as you keep said, we could still trade with the EU, we could save the th th figures around but, 50. But you can't, but you can't. What you will have to do is to negotiate 28 different free trade agreements. You know how difficult it is to negotiate a free trade agreement? I've dealt with two of them. It is a really difficult task. Why do you think we should get out? 
55 million pounds a day is a lot of money. And I'll go back. Well, that's the figure you've had spun to you, I'm afraid, and it is fundamentally incorrect. This is a much bigger question, actually, than just about trade and jobs. This is about what sort of country we want to be and how we see our place in the world. And the truth is that Europe hasn't just brought us jobs and growth. It's also brought us peace since the Second World War. It's brought us the ability to negotiate with other countries and to work together to try and ta tackle some really big issues like climate change, like um, the, the threat from global terror. And it's also meant that we've got protections at work, like paternity leave, maternity leave, which I've got a particular interest in at the moment, paid, paid annual leave, and rights, health and safety rights at work that keep my constituents alive on a daily basis. Who wants to see us stay in Europe then? Okay, uh, anyone else who doesn't want to see us stay in Europe? Well, I feel like the European Union is not only an undemocratic organization, I feel like it's an anti-democratic organization. I feel like the people at the head of the European Union, um, like Jean-Claude Juncker, they have a fundamental contempt for national democracy. The, you know, uh, this is a, an organization that can slap a, a 1.7 billion pound bill on our desk with impunity. Um, this is an organization that can say, uh, after the Greek elections, uh, that there can be no, uh, no democratic choice against the European treaties. I just, I, th I think it's, it destroys nation state democracy. Okay, let's get our next question please from Anya, there you go. My question is, do you think the lack of women MPs in Parliament is a problem, and if so, what is the solution? Lisa? Um, well, yes, and um, I'd start by saying that it's great to be on this panel tonight, but it's not unusual at all for me to be on a panel that's all men. In fact, the other day I was on a panel with three men called Simon, and I thought <laughs> it does come to something when you're outnumbered <laughs> by three to one by people called Simon. Um, the truth is that we don't have enough women, not just in Parliament, but actually in positions of responsibility right across society. Now, there are, lots, there are lots of different ways that you can tackle that, but I think politics, I think um, the judiciary, I think the media, I think they've operated as a closed shop for men for a very long time. And that is starting to change, but it's only starting to change in this Parliament because Labour introduced something called the all-women shortlist. Now, this was hugely controversial. I was selected on an all-women shortlist, but I am the first ever female Member of Parliament for Wigan. You can't tell me that the, in the entire history of parliamentary democracy, there's never been a woman good enough to represent Wigan before. Uh, actually, this links into the point about representation as well and how people feel about parliaments, because any parliament that is not properly representative of the society that it is seeking to represent is automatically going to feel itself at distance from the population at large uh, and whether it's the point about women whether it's about diversity whether it's about the age of people in Parliament whether it's based upon the sort of backgrounds that those people are coming from the Parliament needs to be reflective of society as a whole it's true about diversity right across society and you've honed in on Parliament but of course Actually, in, in terms of other aspects of our society, it's better in Parliament than it is in the judiciary, in a whole range of other, other jobs. I mean, it's only now that we're managing to get women on boards of companies. Why do you think there aren't more women in positions of power, Anya? I feel like women in particular feel like their voice isn't heard, probably because when they look at their current MPs, they can't see for themselves because it's not really reflective of society when today we've got four MPs, only one of them's a woman, why is it not 50-50%? Would you like to be a politician? Maybe, one day. I'd like to ask the lady, would you want to be getting on in life because of your abilities or become someone and just put you on a short list? Oh. No Sorry, let the, let, let the, why don't you let the lady answer? Why, why, excuse me, why don't you let the lady, I asked her a question. No, I do agree, it shouldn't just because you're a woman that you should be prioritised or anything, you should be on ability, but I don't personally think that the men are more able, they're just getting prioritised. I don't right. think we and should and be prioritised. Right, well, that it's great really you say good. that, and I think what we've got to do as a society is, is make people feel empowered. OK, time for one final question from Ella. How and why did you get involved in politics, and would you recommend it as a career? Great question. Lisa. 
Um, well, I grew up in Manchester during the 80s and early 90s at a time when this city was really divided. There was huge unemployment, there were people sleeping rough on the streets. And you could see very clearly it was as a result of political choices that were being made hundreds of miles away in London. And I just thought, you know, it's no use just being angry about this. You've got to get involved if you really want to change it. I'm doing it because I've had enough. I voted for two of these parties all my life. And the problem is we're now run by career politicians, people who've never had a real job. They have no experience of what it's like to have to go out and earn a wage, worry about paying the bills at the end of the month, wondering whether they can pay the mortgage. Yes, I wish I got engaged much earlier. And, I, and, and remember, the future will be controlled by you. Please get in, engaged in politics. Would I suggest other people go into politics? Do you know what? Probably not. Why? Why would you say because no? Because I think, I think your family lose a lot. You know, my, you know, my daughter hardly saw me during her, her period of, you know, from being a, a toddler to growing up. And I, I just think, really, perhaps I sacrifice too much for my, my family going into politics. And I, I do have, we were talking about it before, I do have sort of pangs of guilt, to be quite honest. Please, don't listen to Mike. Get involved, because your future and the coming generation's futures are at stake and it's in your hands to do something about it. Yeah. Ella, would you go into politics? No. <laughs> no! <laughs> Why not? It's not really my thing. Um, I'd want to be a politician um, to get my point across and um, to make sure that the little people were looked after, not just, um, you know, the big fat cats yeah. or, you know, people, people who, uh, your fam families and, and, and things like that where, um, they're suffering death because of minimum wage, because of all the problems, and I want to try and resolve them problems. Fantastic. That seems like a really good place to end. Many thanks to our panel. Thanks to all of you in our audience. Thanks to the People's History Museum in Manchester for making us so welcome for the Granada Reports Election 2015 School Debate. Thank you. I've never really been that into politics, if I'm being honest, but I felt like it gave me a better outlook on it. And I've never felt like it was a very humane thing because everyone was just making decisions more based on money as opposed to people. But I feel like meeting people and hearing people talk about their views kind of changed the way I felt about that. It actually opened my eyes to politics in general and sort of considering going into it now. It was exhausting. <laughs> we've, uh, we've had everything from the minimum wage to Britain's role in Europe um, to the National Health Service. But it shows that young people are really deeply political, even though some of the young people in that audience wouldn't consider themselves to be. It gives me a huge amount of hope for the future of this country. The level of knowledge that these young people have means that they've clearly thought about the issues before they've arrived here today. And I certainly found myself being placed on my toes with some of the questions. It's really encouraging to see a lot of young people getting involved with politics. A lot of the media represents us as apathetic, but I think things like this show that there are young people who do care and our voices do need to be listened to. Well, they certainly didn't let any of those politicians off the hook, no, did they? They, they did really not. knew what they were they talking about. Not. Amazing stuff from everyone at the People's and you can read Lucy's school debate blog and find out more about what went on behind the scenes on our website. Go to itv.com slash Granada. Yeah, as you say, fascinating stuff there. OK, you are watching Granada Reports, our top story tonight. The police officer in charge at Hillsborough has admitted to the new inquest he lied when he accused Liverpool fans of getting into the ground illegally. David Duckinfield said he had ordered an exit gate to be opened, which resulted in thousands of supporters getting into overcrowded pens in the Leppings Lane end of the ground. Mr Duckinfield will continue giving evidence tomorrow. And here's what's coming up on the ITV News at 6.30 with Alistair. BBC under pressure over Clarkson. A petition in his support tops 300,000. No, 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 no. That's the presenter involved in a fracas with a producer makes light of it. An investigation continues. Paul Gascoigne says phone hacking helped make him an alcoholic. He's furious the mirror didn't take him on in court. And pictures at an exhibition.
but not with a selfie stick, says the National Gallery. Join Charlene Wright and me at 6.30. Just time tonight for a bit of football news and there's a big local derby in the championship tonight as Blackburn take on Bolton. Wanderers boss Neil Lennon says his team need another three wins to guarantee.